For those who were absent, today in class, um, I covered the basics of El Nino um, during what the winds are like in normal conditions, um, and then what it's like in El Nino conditions. For La Nina conditions, it's actually going to be exactly the opposite of El Nino. So they are two completely different processes, but they are just literally opposite of each other. Just opposite. So to understand what El Nino is, we need to know what should normally be happening. All right. Um, so this is going to be focused off the west coast of Peru. So looking around like right here. Okay. And to get like an idea of where our equator is, so you can assume the temperature of the water, um, our equator is going to be about right here in that area. So that water is going to constantly be warmed. Something to keep in mind. Okay. And so we need to um, consider the wind that's blowing across the equator, the wind. We know wind will move water. Um, offshore winds can cause upwelling. Onshore winds can cause downwelling. This, we're going to focus a lot more on what happens with the upwelling. So you're going to have um, currents will be flowing um, during normal conditions. A water current will flow north along the west coast of South America. It brings cold, nutrient-rich water. This is your Humboldt current. So you have a current that will flow north. Remember, if um, we have water coming from the deep, it's also going to be bringing along with it a lot of nutrients, which will be great for our producer population. Okay, and so what's going to allow this current to be um, coming to the west coast of Peru, bring up all that nutrients, um, it's winds that blow southwest. They blow water away from the west coast. So these are um, our trade winds. Um, just based on the trade route that was taken, that's why they're called trade winds. We have really strong trade winds that will blow water off the coast of Peru. And I shouldn't say really strong. They're just, they're strong. So they blow water away from the west coast of Peru. Cold water will replace it because that's going to be an offshore wind. It's moving a bunch of water and it causes low water pressure at the surface, just like we talked about on Monday, five days ago. And that low water pressure has to be replaced by water. And that water that replaces it is coming from the deep. Not only is water moving up, but also all the dissolved nutrients. And this is going to cause upwelling. And along with that upwelling, we're going to have a lot of productivity, a lot of primary productivity. So a lot of photosynthesis happening quickly. If we have a lot of photosynthesis from our producers, then we can assume we're going to have a lot of primary consumers. So small fish, zooplankton, um, sardines, anchovies. Anchovies are brought up a lot in the exam questions. Seabirds, they are to feed at the surface. Large marine animals, whales, sharks, the food chain follows each other. Okay, and if we consider the coast of Peru and we know um, like what kind of demographic of a country it is, um, it is not what we would consider a high income country. So they're most likely gonna, people living on the coast there are gonna be very heavily rely, um, relying on their fish catches and, and what they do for fishing as, as a business. And so this allows them to maintain a lot of money for their fishing industry. Um, it allows for food for their uh, communities and jobs. <clears throat> okay, um, and just to touch on what's going to happen on the other side then, our trade winds are relatively strong. They're normal. They're pushing all this warm water off the coast of Peru over to the Australasia area or Australia Asia. That's good for them because if we know what happens with warm water, especially when you have warm air blowing over it. It happens here all the time in the summer. You're going to have evaporation. I shouldn't have made those arrows blue. Mabi. You're going to have a lot of evaporation, which will then cause a lot of condensation. And what's going to come with that then is precipitation. That's good because Australia has a lot of fires often. 
Um, things to consider within the ocean, though, is that when we have a lot of precipitation, we're going to decrease salinity. When you have a lot of cloud cover, cloud cover is actually going to decrease the sun penetration into the water, which will decrease photosynthesis a bit. Photosynthesizers need sunlight so they can synthesize glucose. And not only that, when we have winds we need, or clouds, we need to consider that there's going to be storms there, probably a lot of wind. That's going to stir up a lot of your water. It's going to produce a lot of waves. Waves are produced by wind um, and cause the water to be pretty turbid, which in and of itself will then again block sunlight penetration and decrease the rate of photosynthesis. Um, not that these exam questions focus on the Australasia area, the Australian Asia area. They do focus on this happening in Peru, and we will have um, similar types of effects from lower sunlight penetration off the coast of Peru during an El Nino. But again, everything that I've just mentioned was a non-El Nino year. Okay, and that's pretty much what I just talked about with the um, precipitation. So during El Nino, your trade winds can completely weaken or they can actually reverse. In this picture you have here, our trade winds have reversed and gone the other direction. Um, in our exam answers, though, we're going to talk about them weakening. And so I'll annotate what we're doing in class today um, below here. So the trade winds, again, trade winds are what blow um, across the equator. Something to recap from earlier this week. Notice this is zero degrees. Here's your northern, here's your southern hemisphere. Due to the spinning of the Earth, Coriolis effect happening. So in your northern hemisphere, and granted that's on, that is land, but in the ocean, your water is going to be deflected um, to the right or clockwise. Likewise, towards the left or counterclockwise in the southern hemisphere. Just to recap earlier this week, but these are your trade winds. They blow um, air, which then moves water across the equator. Okay, um, ideally, when you guys did your lecture notes, you should have watched this video. That's what I showed briefly in class today. Um, it shows both of these. There's a lot of content in there, some atmospheric talk that won't necessarily be pertinent to our syllabus, but it is helpful to see this happening. All right, and I'm going quick because my planning is short today. But here we go. Um, El Nino, what we're gonna wanna start with is that the winds, trade winds that blow around the equator slow down, they weaken. You can mention that they can also reverse just based on this picture down here. You don't have to, I'm, my exam answers always go with trade winds weaken. Okay, and so this is gonna stop the warm water that's piling up at the equator, that warm water from going towards Australasia. It's also going to prevent there to be any sort of precipitation like we saw right here in the Australasia area. Instead, those things are actually going to happen off the coast of Peru. So instead, warm water builds up along the coast of South America, the west coast, along where Peru is. It's like with my orange right there. And this will prevent or extremely weaken upwelling from that Humboldt current, which is one of your vocab words. This definition right here. A cold water current with low salinity levels that flows north along the western coast of South America is also called the Peru current. Um, in your exam questions, I really only have ever seen it called the Humboldt current, but also called the Peru current. And if it's upwelling, then we know it's not just bringing up cold water from the deep, it's also bringing up nutrients. Nutrients are not used by fish. Nutrients are used by photosynthesizers. Consider them fertilizers, but do not put that in an exam answer, of course. Um, so what we're gonna see, and though the exam answers don't focus on this, I'll just touch on it because I typed it. Um, your Indonesia, Australia area, so the Australasia area, they're not gonna get all this warm water coming across anymore. That's not gonna happen. And, and that warm water, like we drew on the top, that warm water caused a lot of cloud cover, which is good for precipitation. 
And so regions over here might be in a drought situation now because they're having a lack of precipitation there. They'll also have a lot of wildfires. But again, the exam questions don't focus on the Australia, Indonesia area. They can have drought conditions. What will happen on the flip side though? So if we have all of these um, clouds forming over here due to all that warm water and evaporation, because that water is really warm. What will happen instead over here is a lot of rain, and that could decrease salinity. Of course, we're going to decrease the sun penetration from the clouds. And though, um, again, this isn't something that's necessarily tested material, Peru and Argentina your um, West Coast countries of South America, they have, they're very mountainous. Like they're built on a subduction zone, essentially. So um, they have some volcanic action or dormant volcanoes, and so they have really high elevation and a lot of high topography. They're gonna experience a lot of mudslides, rock falls, landslides, lots of rain, lots of flooding, and not much fish. So we have an increase in rainfall, bad flooding, mudslides, and that's going to be um, Peru. All right, photosynthesis or primary productivity. Productivity definition is the rate of photosynthesis, how fast glucose is being made. But that is going to decline quickly. And fish that need to thrive in cold water will also die quickly because you're not having that upwelling, bringing cold water. Productivity goes down, again, photosynthesis, because, again, you're not having the upwelling of nutrients. And it's if you consider them like fertilizers, again, not something you would write on a test, that's what feeds your producers. And if your producers are happy, then your primary consumers are happy. And then secondary consumers and tertiary and then quaternary. And your food chain, is it follows. Animals will migrate down to this area. Obviously, they don't know if it's going to be an El Nino year or not. Um, they can't discuss that with each other or check with the weatherman. But... They will migrate down here and there's going to be no food available. Um, fisheries. Fisheries are what you would call fishing companies, but fisheries and local fishing villages are left with a loss of fish and income. All right, and though it's this is a very important um, statement, it's of course the smallest way to go. Um, photosynthesis will decline because nutrients are missing. So your producer population is low. Primary consumer population is low. Secondary consumer population is low, and so on. All right. What I first talked about was during a normal year. This is during an El Nino year, a warming phase. So when we have the weakening or the complete reversal of trade winds. And so in class, we filled this out, and you have a blank copy of it on your Google Classroom. El Nino, La Nina, place for you to put your definition. Um, I'm not reversing like gender colors. There is no such thing, literally. Um, but El Nino is a warm current that develops, causes widespread death in local food chains. La Nina is a cold current that develops off the coast of Ecuador um, or Peru. And it will decrease your surface temperatures in the Pacific. All right, so for what's occurring in the El Nino, we're gonna have um, a decrease in the strength of our offshore winds. And this is going to keep Warm water right off the coast of South America. And it's the west coast of South America. Our trade winds are weak or completely reversed. But again, just for the simplicity of it, um, I'm, I'm just going to keep it like that. All right, so I'm just gonna do an arrow. First, I'll show you the equator. Here's about the area of the equator. So 
That'll be my arrow for the trade wind. Nothing grand about it. All right, and it's going to keep all this warm water. You're right at the equator, right? Zero degrees. It's going to keep all this water piled up over here. Instead of going with a strong trade wind, getting blown over to the Australia-Asia region. And so a couple, <clears throat> a couple things are going to happen. I'll discuss one at a time. With all that warm water, you can have a lot of evaporation happening. And so we're going to have a lot of cloud formation. Okay, clouds bring on precipitation. This could decrease some salinity. Therefore, um, cause the density to change. Okay, and off to the side, I'm actually just going to sketch what will be a quick thermocline so we can see how that will change. Pause this where you need, of course. All right, consider the sunlight penetration. With a lot of clouds, sunlight penetration isn't going to be great. Somebody's knocking at my door, and if I pause, I'm scared that it's not going to, like, re-record. So I'm not going to answer it. That's not going to be good for photosynthesis. That's sunlight penetration. Um, clouds will bring on a lot of, um, well, with your storms, rather. It's going to be stormy, so you're going to have a lot of waves. They should go the other direction. There we go. You'll have a lot of waves. And that's going to stir up your water. Lots of turbidity. So another reason where sunlight penetration is going to be low. You have the cloud cover. And you're going to have a lot of waves stirring up the sediment, stirring up the water. All right. And for any producers that are there, I haven't talked about the nutrients yet, but we have a lot of warm water piled up. A lot of warm water piled up. Not just a little bit of the surface. There is a surplus. Um, I can't answer right now. I'm sorry. I don't trust pausing it. Temp. And obviously we have depth here in meters. Why does this matter? So the thermocline keeps really low dense water at the surface. And when you have little phytoplankton, they need to be at the surface. They don't have arms, tails, or legs to swim up to, towards the surface to be in sunlight. So they're stuck at like the mercy of your top floating low density layer of water because it's very warm. And where a thermocline may have sh previously have been maybe here, right? That would keep them up higher in your water column. Well, now you have so much warm water piled up that you have a lot of warm water for the surface layer. And that just causes you to have a deeper area of warm water. If your sunlight can only penetrate so far, right, in the <clears throat> open ocean, it's about 150, 200 meters, but on the coast, it's about 50 meters because of waves and wind. What if the sunlight's only going this far? With all that warm water piled up, you have a thermocline that's much deeper. And those producers, your phytoplankton, the ones down here, yeah, right. They can't swim themselves back up. They don't have arms, tails, or legs. Phyto is leaf-like. Plankton means floater. They're, literally, their job is to float and photosynthesize. So they need to be in the higher sunlit layers of water. So that's something that I'm just going to mention because it is um, a topic that we can mention in the exam question. Okay, so we talked about warm water being there, the cloud cover from the increase in evaporation, so therefore you're going to have a precipitation. Um, Wind causing waves, excess turbidity, 
No, that's great. But the, the main thing that we need to consider is what's going to happen to the Humboldt current. So we know that upwelling happens when you have offshore winds. And we just showed that our offshore winds are much weaker during El Nino. The trade winds that blow across, they're much weaker. So if there's upwelling, it's also going to be weak. Tiny arrow. My arrows will definitely be different between the two pictures. Oops, Humboldt current. All right, and th again, the reason why I put videos and notes is just to support you with things that I can't show you. So this video is doing the same thing essentially with some more terms that you won't necessarily need for your exam um, that I am. Tree winds are weak, so let's finish out what we're putting for our exam answer. Therefore, we're going to have low upwelling, which causes low amount of nutrients coming up. Again, these aren't nutrients for animals. These are nutrients for producers. Nutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus, things that cause algal blooms in our Indian River Lagoon when we have a surplus of them going in. Um, sulfurs potassiums, calcium, magnesium. When you ma plants need magnesium to synthesize chlorophyll so they can absorb sunlight. Nitrogen, phosphorus, those things are needed so they can make um, amino acids, which make proteins, enzymes. They also need to make nucleic acids like so they can synthesize DNA or RNA. So if we have a low amount of nutrients, we're gonna have a low producer population. If you have a low producer population, consider your trophic levels. Trophic level one, two, three, four. Producer is always on the bottom no matter what. Here's your primary consumer, secondary consumer, tertiary consumer, and so on. If the producer population is low, what are the primary consumers going to eat? They're also going to be low. Everybody suffers, including the fishermen. So low producer population, we're going to have low consumer populations. The biggest flaw I see my students do is this link right here between nutrients and producers. Students all the time will go, there's low upwelling, so a low amount of nutrients, so your fish are going to die. No, 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 no. You can't jump to the consumer. We don't feed our fish these things. We don't feed them fertilizer from the garage. We don't feed them rocks. We don't feed them soil. That's, that's not what we do. Consumers, including humans, we can't eat that. All right, and so what will, this, what will happen with this? We're going to have a low amount of money for fishermen, low biodiversity, so a variety of species that are in an area and their own like genetic diversity there will also be low. Lots of storms, lots of rainfall. Our questions primarily orient themselves towards the lack of upwelling, therefore um, a decrease in your producers and consumers and then what that's gonna do for fishermen. And we'll see that on the practice exam questions. And so if you look at the um, little images I put on there, here's your El Nino, weak, tiny little arm. But La Nina, she's strong. Look at that arm. Good for her. La Nina, she's very strong. This is the exact opposite of what's going to happen now. Definition here is the cold current that develops off the coast of Ecuador. Check this out. So here is my little tiny trade wind arrow. Much stronger trade winds. Much stronger. So 
strong trade winds. And so what's occurring here? We have an increase in the strength. That's weird, of offshore winds. Warm water is pushed away toward Australasia from the South American coast and the west side of the west coast of it. And so for pushing all that warm water away, this is why it causes cooler temperatures in the Pacific. So we're gonna have um, a large pile of cooler water here. Thermocline will be much higher up. We're not gonna have all these clouds, so lacking. We're not going to have the clouds here because we're not going to have an excess of warm water with a lot of pre um, evaporation and then precipitation. But what we will have is a very strong current, a very strong Humboldt current moving up. I think on your note paper, the arrow size is, is a good visual. If the current is very strong, that's upwelling, lots of nutrients, producers will be happy. Primary consumers will be happy. Fishermen will be happy. Everybody wins. The trade winds are strong. Therefore, we're gonna have an increase and upwelling cause an increase in nutrients. Again, these nutrients are for producers, not fish. Cause an increase in producer population, which causes an increase in all of your consumer population. Zuh. This will cause much more money for fishermen. and fisheries, and we're gonna have an increase in biodiversity of organisms there. So it's all about the trade winds and what's happening to that Humboldt current. In your notes, you should have that, the stronger trade wind current, stronger than normal conditions. It's gonna blow more warm surface water away from Peru. So more cold water will upwell with the Humboldt current more nutrients, more phytoplankton, more small fish, more big fish, happy ecosystems. And though the bell's gonna ring um, in just a moment, I'll post the exam answers on your Google Classroom and how you can answer these. But just so you can see how these answers flow, um, anchovies feed on microscopic algae called phytoplankton. So they're giving you a food web. During El Nino events, low trade winds, Changes in the anchovy population have been recorded. Explain, so why and how an El Nino event could affect the population of blue sharks. So we'll wanna go food chain on that, which is why I left a space down here for you to sketch out what that would look like. And we're gonna start with, during El Nino, um, your trade winds weaken. This will keep warm water off the coast of South America, and this is gonna cause a lack of upwelling. And I'll post that answer. And then again, you have explain why and how the causes of an El Nino event. So a weakening of your trade winds. Describe how this could cause the collapse of the Peruvian anchovy population. Anchovies are small fish, so we need to go low trade winds, low upwelling, low nutrients, low producers, low anchovy population. And again, I'll post these completed answers on your Google Classroom. And our exam is so soon. Yay! You guys later.